we find that students, kids who learn Arabic, spoken Arabic in school, even for one hour, even for one week, what we find, they right away, it changes their attitude towards Arabs. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Rolinerblau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is Professor Ilana Shohami. She is chair of the Language Education Program at Tel Aviv University and the author of many books, including The Languages of Israel, Policy, Ideology, and Practice. Professor Shohami, welcome to Faith Complex. Nice to be here. Well, modern Israeli Hebrew is a bit of an anomaly amongst the modern languages, and you are uniquely qualified to tell us why. Why is it an anomaly? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to observe Hebrew because it's a language that had been revived in a way. It hadn't been used by anybody as an oral language for a number of hundreds of years, right, really. And the idea of using Hebrew in Israel is unique because here you take a language that nobody can speak it and you recreate it as a spoken vernacular, as a language that people communicate in. Is there any parallel in the history of linguistics? To Actually the not, but, we have, but what we have to remember when we talk about Hebrew, even when I say reviving, that it hadn't been really revived in the sense that as a written language, mm -hmm. it's always been around. And a language of prayer? and pr language of prayers, and people could actually speak the language while reading it. Mm. So it was a spoken language when you would read it. Some, some linguists are saying that the Hebrew we speak today is not really the Hebrew of the old time, mm. that actually the new Hebrew, is, or, or, or as, as Gilad Zuckerman calls it, uh, the Hebrew, the Israeli, he called Israelite. And the idea is that Hebrew of today is a combination of all the languages mm. that have been spoken by the m Jews who came from so many other languages. Now, Hebrew isn't the only official language of the modern state of Israel. There's another language, an other, yeah, if you will. Tell us, about, <laughs> tell us about the other. Yeah, the other language, of course, is Arabic. And, you know, Arabic had been official. It still is official. Mm -hmm. It's not that there was a decision to make it official because of inclusive reasons in, the, in 1949, in, 50, in 1950 actually. Because the point was, let's keep the Arabs to speak their own language so they won't really integrate with us. So it was an issue of separation, not an issue of inclusion. And what is the official role? You see it on signs in Israel, for example. You see dubs on right. television programs. Where else do you see Arabic? Officially, okay. in modern officially, Israel. Officially, you're right. It's mostly on paper. I mean, sometimes, and take the example of the languages of the signs, because it, I study a lot the linguistic landscape, which is languages of the public space, linguistic landscape. And basically, what we see is everything is English and Hebrew. You hardly see any Arabic. Even in Arab towns today, we see more Hebrew sometimes than Arabic. In your estimation, has the Israeli government properly promoted the Arabic language? Mm, I would say they promoted Arabic, but for the wrong reasons. It promoted Arabic in the way that they're trying to do it here in the U.S. now, as a security language, mm. as a defense language, as good, we'll get more people who can go to the military to work for intelligence and so on. And for example, one of the things they're promoting is modern standard Arabic still and don't recognize the spoken vernaculars for all kinds of reasons. I mean, Palestinian Arabic would have been a language that would allow us to communicate with Arabs on the street. So it's, it's promoting it as, as a very, I call it like Latin of enemies. Mm. Mm. In my research in, that I've done in a number of studies, we find that students, kids who learn Arabic, spoken Arabic in school, even for one hour, even for one week, what we find, they right away, it changes their attitude towards Arabs. They stop seeing, they stop seeing Arabs as enemies or as a geopolitical issue, but as people. So I think the, the teaching of spoken Arabic, whatever dialect, normal, probably the local dialect, which is Palestinian dialect, will be very useful for children. But the government is saying, oh, it's not official, Arabs don't recognize it, and so on and so on. You see today a process which is kind of frightening, I'd say. It's called, I call it oftentimes benign neglect, 
where the Arabic language is being lost, actually, especially in mixed cities. Some of the Arab students don't know how to read and write Arabic because they give priority to Hebrew. So Hebrew is kind of swallowing, in a way, Arabic as well. But we don't want to place an undue expectation on the Israeli government. This is more or less normal for a nation state. A nation state often is affiliated with one national language, which it seeks to impose upon its citizens. Let's go to East Jerusalem, which is um, uh, governed by the Palestinian right. Authority. So I guess my question for you is, are they insisting that their students learn modern Israeli Hebrew? I don't know. In some places you do have uh, courses in, uh, in Hebrew, but I think it will be really too much to expect in a situation like that for them to learn Hebrew. I think we're talking about two groups. We're talking about the Jews who are dominant group, mm -hmm. they have the power language and so on, and we're talking about Arabs who are the minority, or even immigrants, I mean, not just Arabs, but like minorities who are, and they have to always learn the power language. So they, even if they don't learn it in school, the, the Arabs in East Jerusalem, they're so much exposed to Hebrew as the dominant language that eventually they will learn it. Let's talk a little bit about the Russians. Uh, we're speaking about, uh, I guess, a million or so immigrants right. from the former Soviet Union. Right. For whatever reasons, they're not warming to the Hebrew language. We found that the kids eventually catch up. So wh what we did find, and I think that's very important to mention in a program like this, people don't understand how long it takes to learn a language. One of the things we found in that study is it takes 9 to 11 years for immigrants who come to a country to learn, to, to perform academically in the language. So it's a very, 9 to 11 years, it's almost the whole school year, so it's a long time. But eventually they do catch up, and the parents are complaining now that they don't want to speak Russian anymore to them. I would say that it takes a long time and we have to realize that and I think that's something important for, for me also in my own work because when I talk about the revival of Hebrew and some of my other studies, I'm interested not in the success stories of my grandfather who made it in Hebrew. I'm, I'm interested in my grandmother mm. or my father, people who were trying to learn Hebrew but could make it and the society marginalize them. What do you do with my grandmother who <laughs> came to Israel, lived in Tel Aviv, Kikar Mlachim, when it was called that, never wanted to learn Hebrew and defiantly refused to speak Hebrew. The only languages were Yiddish, Polish, Russian. Yeah. What does one right. do with a case like my grandmother? Yeah, that I think she would have been, and she would have been, she, she, I mean, I don't know if she really didn't want or... She didn't want to learn or Hebrew. Or tried to learn she it. She never tried. Work, never even tried. <laughs> They're happy people. Talk about people in different communities. They go on t talking a variety of languages, one language, a number of languages. But I think the mistake it's not, was not, the Zionism was not so much in terms of not promoting Yiddish. I think that was a smart, that was a smart move. But I think the idea of not legitimizing and not encouraging people, at least in their homes or in their communities, to maintain these languages that they've used all their lives. We hear the use of the term plurilingual citizen. What is a plurilingual citizen? So a plurilingual citizen is a person who knows a number of languages, who can use a number of languages. Sometimes he or she, they only understand the language, and they, you can have conversations where you speak in French and somebody answers in German, but we understand each other. So the idea of schools is to start very early with a number of languages. Let's say first grade you learn one language, third grade another one, and you don't have to reach very, very high proficiency in each one of the languages, but at least you can create communication in a number of languages. I take it you'd like to move the Israeli educational system to a plurilingual model, correct? Yeah, very much, especially I think it's so typical of Israel where you have heritage languages. People spoke, if you talk to anybody, anybody, and this is exactly what I'm doing now in my work, what I do t today, I talk to people in the streets of Tel Aviv, older people oftentimes, and find out in interviews how they learn the language. What was the cost for them on lear of learning a language? Like, what are the things they could do in a language that they spoke before they cannot do today? Hmm. So you hear somebody, oh, I used to go to the theater. Here, I never go to the theater because there's no, no theater in other languages. I never read books in other languages. So I'm interested very much in the cost of reviving languages.